Here's the Yagi antenna that I designed previously. And here's an Evolved antenna that I made. It is a better antenna than the Yagi. I designed the Yagi by hand in about 15 minutes, while the Evolved antenna was designed in less than 3 seconds by a program that I wrote. Both of the antennas are optimized for the same frequency, 2.4 GHz, and in this video I'll show you how I made the Evolved antenna work. So this was the output of my program. My antenna was just a simple piece of wire bent in specific places. The thing with antenna design is that it is inherently difficult, and in many ways not completely understood. So making one tiny change can completely alter the behavior of your antenna. So you can't usually calculate the ideal antenna design for a given frequency. But we do have programs that can calculate how well an antenna performs. Specifically, I used NEC 2++, which allows you to input antenna specifications and output performance all within your own code. But back to the bigger picture. I wanted to design an evolutionary algorithm to design antennas. An evolutionary algorithm works in exactly the same way as evolution does in nature. You first start with a population of random individuals. With nature, only the fittest survive from generation to generation, as is the case with evolutionary algorithms. You determine the fitness of each individual and kill off the individuals that didn't perform well. Then, only the most fit individuals are able to pass on their genes to the next generation. In the algorithm, this is done by making new individuals with characteristics derived from fit individuals. Like the actual biological process of evolution, mutation is also something very important to the algorithm. This allows for advantageous characteristics to appear and be selected for. In the algorithm, after the population has been replenished, you will have completed one generation and can run through the whole process over and over again. With today's computers, you can simulate many thousands of generations. After enough generations, the population will eventually stabilize on a very good solution. Just as all plants and animals around us are very efficient biological organisms, our algorithm will end with a very effective antenna. Every antenna in my program will have a certain number of genes. In my case, each gene represents the coordinate of where the antenna would bend. Bending a wire in a certain way could allow your signal to be reinforced or canceled out. That is why we let genetic algorithms work out which solution is best, just as evolution determines the best version of a species. Now here's my code. I had originally written my program in C++, but I later rewrote it in Python, in the Python binding of NEC 2++, to allow access to some of the fantastic Python libraries for data manipulation. The program does everything that I described earlier. It creates an initial population of random antennas, sorts by fitness, kills the bottom half, and then breeds the antennas, all with mutation, of course. I made it so you can specify the wire thickness, frequency, the number of generations, and population size prior to runtime. If you were to do this project on your own, I'd highly recommend that you write your own code, as mine is very condensed and frankly hard to read, and also because writing your code would allow you to learn a whole lot more. Unfortunately, for the specific application of the 2.4 GHz antenna, your final antennas are going to be quite small because the wavelength is only about 12.5 cm. NEC2++ uses NEC2 which isn't optimized for this use. However, NEC4 is, but it's proprietary and not available without a license. So just running with this NEC2 implementation limited the number of generations I could perform if I were to design 2.4 GHz antennas. I did try my algorithm with a lower frequency signal, 1688 MHz, which is, the which is the frequency that GOES satellites broadcast at. Even after only 100 generations and a population size of 70, I did get some fantastic results. For example, here is a randomly generated antenna, one you'd find in the first generation. Here is the best performing antenna from generation 100. It is a massive spike in one direction. These two diagrams are also scaled differently. The small details in the diagram you see on the right are about as large as the biggest lobes on the left diagram. The linear gain of generation 100 antenna is about five times as far. Also, even though my program outputs the gain and the antenna geometry, I am using an NEC2 program to visualize their performance. Without access to NEC4, I need to do something different if I were to design a 2.4 GHz antenna. I rewrote my code to utilize the optimize function within the SciPy library. 
I still had issues with NEC2, but I had success occasionally, which is all I need if I am looking to design just one antenna. Another thing I had issue with was the constraint. For me, I had set the maximum wire length of the antenna. Sometimes the program seemed to ignore the constraint, and sometimes it was spot on. But despite the many issues I had to design, I specifically wanted one with a wire length of under 10 centimeters. And this was it. So then I was ready to try it out in practice. My plan was to use this F-type connector so I could connect a coax cable to one side and put my antenna on the other side. And then I also wanted a ground plane. And I was lucky to have this big metal disc lying around that seemed perfect for the job. Even had a hole in it. So after enlarging the hole so it was the right size to put the F-type connector in, I then tightened the connector down onto the disc with the nut that came with it. This not only allowed it to have a mechanical connection with the disc, but also an electrical connection. This setup of connecting the antenna to one side of my connector and the coax to the other side of the connector seemed to work pretty well, but obviously I didn't have anything to hold it up. So I went searching on my parts bin and I found this old project box I had. So my plan for the box was to take my disc and then mount it on the top of the box. I did this to obviously support the disc, but I put it at, on this specific side so that I wouldn't have to bend the coax cable more than I had to. And then just to be sure, I laid out all my coax cables, and then I used the one I thought was the most flexible. And then when I went to drill the hole, I wanted to drill the hole a little bit smaller than I had drilled it in the metal disc. This is because I didn't have another nut for my connector, which meant that I had to thread it. And to make matters worse, I didn't have the right size cap. So that meant I had to use something else. So I ended up using this coax to SMA adapter only because it had this nice grip on the side. Uh, but I ended up using my pliers anyways. Uh, not the most mechanically sound solution, but this isn't an overly weight-bearing application, so it seemed to work all right. And so as I went to stand it up for the first time, I kind of realized that the whole thing tipped over because of the coax cable. My plan all along was to drill a hole in the cover for the bin but I thought doing that would solve the problem. So I went, went ahead and did that. And then when I put the lid back on, once I had screwed it on, it still kind of tipped over, which was unfortunate, but it was all right. Since my solution to that was I had this piece of wood that I found. It was already used, but that's all right. And then I drilled holes in the bottom of it. I did this so I could mount screws through the bin and into a piece of wood. I will admit, it, they were pretty difficult to get the screws in, especially the ones in the back, but luckily I had this flexible adapter for my screwdriver, which I never used before, but it came in handy. And then after putting the screws in and then putting the, the lid back on the box, everything seemed to be nice and stable, which was very good. And then once I had the whole assembly together, I wanted to test it out to make sure everything was connected where it should be, and then also everything was not connected where it shouldn't be. So I just used this random piece of wire here to check the, the connections, and everything seemed to work out well. And then afterwards, I was thinking to myself what I was going to use for the actual material for the antenna. And then after a while thinking, I realized that coax, specifically this, the center conductor of a piece of coax cable, would be perfect since it is designed for the F-type connector that I'm using. So I got a whole big piece of coax, and then I stripped the whole thing down all the way to the center conductor, which was really weird. I'd never done that before, especially taking off the entire shielding was, again, something I had never done. And then... Also of note is that I had special um, coax strippers, um, specifically this is RG6 cable I'm using here, and those are really helpful. You saw those uh, earlier, they were, they were green, those are nice. And then once I got everything all down, I had just this big long piece of copper wire, which I could make a lot of antennas out of. So of course the first one I made was the one I designed earlier, which is this one here. And of course I wanted to test it out in the real world. So I chose 2.4 GHz specifically because that is one of the frequencies at which Wi-Fi works at. The other one is 5 GHz. I didn't choose that because that would have resulted in an even smaller antenna, which wouldn't have worked very well in the NEC2++ program, which I had used earlier. And then the metric I was going to use was latency. Uh, that essentially measures how quickly your computer can connect with your router through your antenna. So last time when I tested out the performance of my Yagi antenna outside, really far away from my router, I actually also tested out the performance of my Evolved antenna. Because I already had everything set up, but more importantly, because I wanted to compare them, because they work at the same frequency. So the latency I got with my Yagi antenna was 107 milliseconds. And then the latency I got with my Evolved antenna was 82 milliseconds. 
By no means are any of those good, uh, but that's in large part due to the fact that I was really far away from my router. But the important thing to note there is that my evolved antenna did perform better than the Yagi. But admittedly, that is probably in part due to the fact that I had a pretty big ground plane on my evolved antenna, and because the Yagi antennas are pretty hard to line up. But I had simulated them in an NEC program prior, and I saw that my evolved antenna without the ground plane had a directivity just slightly lower than the Yagi, and with the ground plane it had a directivity just slightly higher. So the performance was pretty much on par, which was really good, especially given the, the physical size of my evolved antenna. And then also something to note is that my evolved antenna had actually a pretty uniform um, radiation pattern, which allowed me to position it in any way. I got the inspiration for this whole project because I saw that NASA did a similar thing in 2006 with one of their missions. And I didn't really see much on evolved antennas afterwards, which really was the inspiration. Now, even though I don't have that much background in programming, I'm really interested in designing antennas. So I, I think my results were pretty successful. But if you compare them to the one that NASA made, which you see here, mine aren't nearly as complicated and, and probably won't perform as well. But I'm pretty proud of what I was able to make in just a couple months compared to what took NASA a couple of years. And granted, they had access to supercomputers, which I just have my laptop here. But overall, I think my results were really good. I actually, I calculated the gain, and it was about 5 decibels, which, to give you some perspective, that's pretty much double the linear gain that you get with your cell phone Wi-Fi antenna, which is pretty good. So that essentially means if you had my evolved antenna in your phone, you would get Wi-Fi signals from twice as far away, which is really good. Again, I really enjoyed this project, and thank you for watching.